series of eGrow Foundation. As you know, and I always mention this, that eGrow is a research-based policy think tank located in NCR. We started about five years ago. Our objective is to provide research-based policy advice to whoever wants it. We have been very fortunate to work with BTIO, Government of India, UNSCAP, and other think tanks across the world. It is just before COVID, it is actually in the early stages of COVID when we realized that the global situation is grim. Slowdown obviously is expected, but research scholars also would find it a challenge because the world is having a universal lockdown. So we started the webinar series with the thought that we continue our research-based policy advice. We bring in researchers, practitioners, academicians who are working on public policy issues and have a blend of Indian scholars with the Western scholars as also work out on contemporary issues if there is something happening. We have been very fortunate. This is about the 190th webinar which we are holding today uh, over this period of about three years. We have had Nobel laureates come here and present their research with us. We have had scholars from across our country as well as neighboring countries like, like Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, attending our webinars and making presentations on these webinar series. India was hosting G20 as the president of G20. Under the G20 series, again, we held about 11 webinars uh, under the task force five on a new international economic order. And then one of the things in the G20 is women empowerment. So we have done about 10 webinars already on women empowerment, and we have a few lined up for the next few weeks. Though the presidency has moved over to Brazil, we thought the topic is so important and pertinent that we continue to work on issues of and doing webinars on women empowerment. Today's issue, again, is very, very important. As you know, it's a burning issue. In India, demographics is changing. Longevity is happening. Old age pensions will become very important. As people grow older, the cohort, which means older, has also uh, many issues, certainly issues of pension and medical health. And what better example to examine than America? America has gone through this transition. And while we were discussing that this is an important public policy issue and our budget is expected in next two months, and this will be an interim budget, we thought it would be important we bring this issue up. And whom else could we invite for this issue? This extremely well-read, well-known, scholarly, academician and a practitioner. We had Professor Kenneth uh, with us. We thought we'd invite him and we are very fortunate he could spare time to be with us. He was very busy and it has taken us almost six months to get him to do this webinar. So professor Kenneth is a professor of practice emeritus at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. I had met him, heard him when I was at IIM Bangalore. I was very impressed with the knowledge that he has. He joined the faculty of Maryland in 2006, and until 2015, he also directed the school's management, finance, and leadership program. From 2001 to 2006, he held the Richardson Chair at the LPJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He was appointed in 2011 to the Maryland Health Exchange Board to help implement health reform in Maryland. He's also a longstanding board member and chair of the Center on Budget and Policy in Washington, DC. He also served as board chair of both the National Academy of Public Administration and the National Academy of Social Insurance. That's why I said he is a very good blend of practitioner and a professor and academician. He spent the spring 2014 semester as a Fulbright scholar in Delhi, India, 
at NCER researching India's health insurance and public pension policies. So he's, he's reasonably well aware of the social security uh, in our own country. Prior to his academic appointments, he served as the commissioner of the Social Security Administration from 97 until 2001. He was the first Senate confirmed commissioner of Social Security after SSA, the Social Security Administration, after SSA became an independent agency and Congress authorized the new cabinet level position. Kenneth, has, Kenneth was the Associate Director for Human Resource Programs at the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President. Prior to his appointment at OMB, Kenneth served as Assistant Secretary for Management and Budget at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. From 78 to 92, he worked on Capitol Hill for Senator Bill Bradley and the U.S. Senate Budget Committee. To chair the session today, we had another expert from our own country, but who has settled and has been teaching in Singapore, Professor Mukul Asher. I've known Professor Mukul Asher from 90 onwards when I was at the RBI, and he had already uh, very credible research by that time on social security. We have been hearing about him. We have been hearing about his research for more than two decades now. Professor Asher is an Indian national and a, was a professor in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, where he is most of the time. In addition to India, Singapore and the US, he has also taught or researched in UK, Sweden, Japan, Australia, and Malaysia. His research has focused on fiscal reforms, India's external economic policies, and pension reform in Asia. He has authored several books and edited several books and has published numerous articles in national and international journals. He served as advisor on the editorial board of several journals, including International Social Security Review and the IM Bangalore Management Review and Journal of International Social Security Review and Journal of Financial Regulation and Compliance too. He is a consulting editor for eSocial Sciences, an electronic journal published from Mumbai. He has been a consultant on tax reforms and social security issues to the government of Gujarat. World Bank, IMF, ADB, OECD, and WHO. He has addressed many academic conferences in business and professional gatherings around the world. He has been involved as faculty teacher and as a resource person in conducting many executive education programs involving high level policymakers. His contact with the print and television media has been reasonably extensive. With this, I hand over the session to Professor Mukuru to conduct the proceedings for the professor. Thank, thank you, Professor Charan Singh, for the kind introduction. I have been a regular follower of eGrow Foundation's research and uh, follow it every day, plus some of the papers and the webinars that you conducted. So it is really indeed a privilege to be able to participate in this webinar. The topic of the webinar, as you mentioned, is very, very topical, uh, is, is very important for the future, both the fiscal aspects and the social resilience of various economies, whether they are uh, demographically advanced economies or who are going to be moderately aging in the next 30 years, like, like India. We have, uh, you have mentioned Professor Kenneth Apfel's uh, work uh, trajectory 
That is, that's that's great. I thank you very much to both of you for for those those uh, uh, opening thoughts. And uh, with this point, I will ask that my PowerPoint get brought up, and uh, and I will I will start off. It's I'm going to be talking about as I was asked to, about the U.S. pensions and health issues, but then also talk about lessons from from my perspective for India or things to think about. And it is opportunities, challenges, and higher costs that we face, that you face, and uh, and I will be talking about that. So next slide. Pensions and health, every nation faces the same thing. Program models need to be uh, 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 consistent with, uh, with both demographic and family changes, workforce changes, but and also fiscally sustainable to society, but also, from my perspective, adequate and inclusive for the population being served. If you made a create a great pension system for 20% of the population, I think that's just plain wrong. Um, also, it needs sound management and delivery systems, uh, efficiency, stability, uh, 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 this is a critical issue and one that, as I will be describing, that is not easy. Uh, next slide. And there's a third piece here, which is that policy options are always constrained. I, I think I hear some background. Uh, policy issues are always constrained by our past um, and our past policy and administration both. So we are burdened by what we have created and we need to figure out where we go from here. Next slide. So in the United States, there's been a very different evolution of pensions and health. The pension system, the US, the public system, the universal public system really evolved as the universal foundation and then other activities private pensions, individual retirement savings, et cetera, were built on top of that system. Uh, in health, it was very much a different situation where private health insurance became the, and it was really employer provided health insurance that was the foundation of, of support um, rather than a supplement and other activities were built then around that. And I'll talk about that next slide. So if we look at the US pension system in terms of evolution very quickly, uh, the uh, uh, back 125 years ago, the US was urbanizing. Um, the, the, up until that time, it was really families that were providing supports for uh, individuals. Um, uh, but as we became increasingly urbanized, um, th that became increasingly obsolete as a as a way to provide economic security. These had established social assistance systems. Um, they were entirely unequal and entirely inadequate, uh, 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 extremely modest, um, and not very many states had them at all at that point in time back then. And then, of course, we have the Great Depression that came along and all those state systems basically as tiny and as insufficient and inadequate as they were pretty much disappeared at that point in time. Uh, so Social Security was enacted um, uh, with, a, with a big national agency um, uh, with a Social Security number for, for workers. Um, uh, they provided benefit determinations. It also became the uh, the structure uh, for uh, cash assistance for the for the elderly. Uh, it was very modest at first. It expanded over time, became increasingly universal. Uh, it has always had a highly efficient administration system. Uh, although it's 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 pre post COVID, it's gotten some stresses. That's what I was talking to the future commissioner about last night. But post enactment of Social Security, that's when the private pension system started to grow 
and supplement Social Security, particularly for the middle third of workers, or the higher third of workers, rather. Um, and all kinds of government actions were taken. Tax incentives, wage and price controls had an impact. Um, uh, the creation of what became known as the three-legged stool for retirement, which would be savings, pensions, and Social Security. Next slide. So we look at Social Security, it is a near, well, it's really a universal system uh, for everyone. Um, for a low earner, um, the average Social Security benefit, this is low earners over their lifetime, um, is about $12,000 a year. So it replaces about half, a little over half of pre-retirement earnings um, to provide more of a foundation for those at the bottom. For a middle wage earner, uh, about $20,000 a year um, for a replacement rate of about 40%, so it declines. Uh, for a high earner, still a higher benefit, $27,000 a year. Um, uh, replacement rate, again, lower. So it is a foundation that is relatively progressive in its system uh, to provide benefits, but also universal so that everybody feels like they are tied in to the system, which is which has helped create the draw, strong degree of support for the system in the U.S. That it's not just about them, it's about us. Next slide. Now, this is old data, but that's what I've got, I'm afraid. Uh, this, this breaks the Social Security, the elderly population, uh, household income into uh, quintiles. And if one goes to the middle one, the middle chart, which is the middle fifth, you'll see that Social Security still amounts to almost two thirds of the income uh, for the average family. Um, pensions, the yellow, um, a little bit of earnings, assets, and uh, uh, so that the, the, the stool is starting to become emerging there. If one goes over to the top two bars, the one on the left and the one on the right, one looks at the two um, bottom quintiles and one sees that there really isn't a three-legged stool. There's really pretty much a one-legged stool, which is security. That's what they, uh, they're, they're uh, also there's some social assistance payments um, uh, on top of that for people who are very, very poor. But in terms of savings and assets, very, very little. When one goes up to the top fifth, which is the lower right box, you've seen a really strong multi-tiered stool be developed with savings, pensions, and, and also work, although this is this is mainly most likely uh, people who are in their 60s. So, uh, so work is actually the fourth tier of, uh, of, of, of uh, later in life income structures, needless to say. Go on, next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the demographic changes, but we've, we are aging. Um, and it is not a question that Social Security costs are going to be rising. Um, and it's going to mean taxes are going to have to be increased. Some of the big choices that we're facing in the U.S. is whose taxes are going to be raised? Is it, is it mostly going to be higher income people? Um, is it going to be somewhat of a broad based tax like the Social Security uh, payroll tax? Um, but, and I would say that in the Democratic Party, this is all about taxes. Uh, in the Republican Party, it's all about the next two things, the benefit growth um, having to decline. Um, although many people in Congress know that we've got to do more to ensure that lower wage workers are mostly protected from any benefit changes that are going to be taking place in the for and most of the changes will probably affect upper income income upper people and upper incomes um, also uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, interest from the Republican side for uh, later retirement um, uh, the Social Security retirement age was for full benefits was increased back in 1983 phased in over almost a half century 
from 65 to 67. There's talk about going further on that. It seems to me that all three of the things above, even though there's intense polarization politically, whenever the next stage takes place, it's going to have a little bit of all three of these things. Um, we look at the rest of our system that uh, employer defined benefit pensions are going to be declining, but there's a lot of interest in finding ways to strengthen low and middle income worker savings systems as well. Uh, now, when I look at this, I think all of that's going to happen. Uh, it is, it's hard to get politicians to come up to the well on it. Um, but these are manageable changes. There is nothing here that is uh, Armageddon in, in any way. This is stuff that can be done um, if politicians are willing to bite the bullet. I just, something just disappeared here. Sorry, give me just a second. Okay. The the um, while we're waiting into this, the point here is these are not hard decisions, and it most likely will take a little bit of everything to make this thing um, uh, get fixed. But it will. And and it's it seems to me it's a few years away. It's a lot of talk going on, and and these are manageable choices. Next slide. If we look at health instead, we have a very very different picture. The insurance was non-existent even into the twenties. Um, then um, employers, some employers, started developing pools. Um, where they would provide hospitalization coverage for their workers for a certain fee, for a certain amount. Uh, in, insurance would cover uh, 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 hospitalization at first. Um, the the uh, government policies greatly encouraged the growth of this private employer-based system. Tax incentives, um, uh, uh, efforts to, um, to encourage uh, employees to provide it. Empl larger employees all do, really. Uh, smaller employees, it's a mixed picture, so lower income workers don't really have too much access to this. But this became the dominant form in the U.S. But what that meant is that many people were left out of the employer based health insurance system. Next slide. And that was really three programs that were established to. Uh, 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 over the half century, uh, in 1965, you know, the elderly had terrible coverage. Of course, they weren't working, uh, so they had bought individual policies or a few, but Medicare was established for the elderly and disabled as a universal social security model, uh, very similar to social security in the sense that it would be universal <coughs> for that population. Uh, 65 through really 2000, Medicaid was expanded federally and at the states to provide a, a low income support system for poor families, relatively poor families, uh, particularly their, their kids. That was really built on a federal state financing model. So, and then lastly, Obamacare was established. And actually when I was in, uh, in India, there was all talk about whether Obamacare was going to go away um, and it didn't, doesn't surprise me. That's what I said at the time. Uh, so most of the uninsured are now covered through Obamacare, which is again, uh, it's built on both the Medicaid model, federal state management, um, and the private insurance system, uh, although with standardized benefits. So the public efforts were aimed to fill three gaps in private coverage and cover a lot of people. Next slide. Now, universalism, I, mean, I ran the social security system. I'm a believer in my bones in universalism. Uh, uh, it, it, it has made a big difference, um, but at a cost. If we look at elderly poverty rates back in even 1960, this is 
a quarter of a century after the creation of Social Security, poverty rates were still 35% for the elderly. Now, 8 to 9% um, elderly uninsured for health back then, even in 1960, was about half, now 2%. Um, if we look at the younger uninsured back in 1960, about a third had no health insurance because they only had pretty much the employer provided system. Now that's down to really, as it is in most countries, very small. In countries with national health systems, you end up with a few folks who are not covered. But the costs are real. Our Social Security is a share of GDP, is now 5% of our economy. And health care, uh, federal health as a share of GDP is 7%. So that's 12% of our economy being devoted to a lot of these changes um, that have, in my opinion, it's not a question of whether they're worthwhile. They absolutely are, but they're, they're real money. It's, it's, you can't get around the fact that this is real. And by 2050, population aging will increase that by 2 or 3% of GDP. Uh, or it could, depending on how much comes out of lower benefits and versus taxes, and another 2 to 3% if we can't figure out how to better control health care costs, which is part of what I'll talk about in a moment. Next slide. So, we're, we're pretty close to universal uh, in the U.S., uh, and it's, it has been built on our patchwork of public-private systems. Uh, which is past as prologue. It's just, you know, it's, we've got this whole amalgam of programs and systems and private public. So the three biggest challenges, we still have some uninsured, although it's small. Uh, bigger thing is growing costs for both individuals and governments. We're now at 18% of the economy, which is unbelievable. Uh, this is not public. This is public and private. Um, but perhaps most important is that we have enormous governance challenges in overseeing and controlling this system that is made up of so many various pools and programs uh, uh, and players. Uh, so uh, uh, to, to really, as much as systems are tried to be done here, uh, it's pretty clear that this is not an easy to fix as pension reform. Pension reform, in my opinion, is a matter of politics coming together and it'll happen. Here, it is a much tougher to deny uh, situation. So if I turn now to India quickly, next slide. You all know these things better than I do. Uh, long tradition of family-based support, but that's changing co-residence, remittances, urbanization, next slide. And as was pointed out by our uh, by our speakers already, you know, it's, it, uh, that population is changing. We're we're getting a larger share of the elderly uh, in India, um, and it's the first generation of near elderly citizens with a lot of economic vulnerability in terms of size. Um, and so, that demographic stuff needs to be thought through and planned for the future, which has been going on in India. The next slide. Well, efforts have been underway clearly to try to address this and growth has been key to that being able to help uh, this take place. e grow is, you know, growth has to be part of the equation and it certainly is in India. And I think that uh, the potential for India becoming an important world player, both for its citizens and for the world, is remarkably important. Next slide. Although I would say that to be an important player on the international stage, uh, in the latter part of the 21st century and not provide basic access to basic security for the elderly or for the population is something that is from from I know many people's perspective, unacceptable. There's got to be better answers, um, and I know movement is underway. So, next slide. I'll start off with pensions briefly. 
this is all things that I think many of you know. It's a formal workforce. Gets a lot of the. Uh, it's a small amount of the population. It's got a system that's not. It's got a lot of problems. It's frankly not the kind of stuff that I spend a lot of time on because I'm more interested in the bottom two thirds than I am the the top. Um, but it does have some sizable problems. Uh, and uh, different states I know are are trying to move back towards DB systems and there's a lot of stresses and strains in that system, but most of it's the informal workforce, not a lot of money in that area. Um, uh, small share of the elderly population. The new retirement schemes that, are, that have been created, um, uh, still a small share, incredibly important and, and positive uh, results. Um, but I also worry about the delivery mechanisms here. Uh, next slide. You know these two programs, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but Indira Gandhi is still a tiny uh, amount of support uh, for the elderly poor. Um, uh, there's been greater movement on APY um, and the saving schemes that, that from my perspective, and again, I haven't been a scholar in this for some years, from my articles that I read about this and the people I've talked to, that there, there is a, a real help here and getting a, a, a savings component uh, early on has tremendous benefits uh, for the population. So this there seems to me that there's more movement on the saving side than there is on the on the foundational side. Next slide. Because I don't I don't think social pensions as they exist are a full answer for basic economic security. Supports are too modest. Too few people covered. The state supports, supplemental supports are, are highly uneven uh, throughout India. Um, not the greatest efficiency in terms of administration and targeting both errors of inclusion and exclusion. Um, and uh, the other side of it is that if this was a, if this became as it is in Social Security, a, that seems to me entirely unaffordable for India over the course of the, the, the next few years. So, but social pensions alone for a small section isn't gonna do it. Next slide. Same is true for retirement savings. Uh, uh, too many informal workers have resources, the sufficient resources to contribute. The accounts are still too small to live adequately in, in old age. Uh, uh, people who are getting in, I know that they're a little, you know, this is mainly for younger, but they're just not gonna have time to accumulate sufficient assets to be able to move forward in this. I think these are really positive steps, but the idea that this is the be all and end all solution seems to me unrealistic. Next slide. So lessons for India to take away from the US pension experience or things to think about, maybe that's a better word because I'm not, uh, that I don't think that states are in the best position to provide basic economic security to the elderly. The uneven results will tell from that, just like they were back in the 20s, in the 1920s in the United States, um, that the unevenness was just dramatic. So f federal action more seems to me to be needed. Uh, universalism, great benefits, but also enormous costs. So keeping an eye on modesty and benefits um, and those more in need seem to me to be uh, uh, critically important. Uh, we have gotten our benefit structure a little too large and it's gonna have to come down some. Uh, that's never easy to, it's, it's a lot easier to start off small and get bigger than it is to get big and then get smaller. Um, I guess the third point here is that uh, we need more retirement savings, clearly. Um, if we don't do that, the pressure to expand our social insurance programs is only going to grow. Um, uh, so, 
we're going to have to do even bolder financial incentives and mandates to have that happen, or else we're going to be turning back to the base program to provide more economic security. I guess fourth is that in the US, we established that, that strong universal public management delivery system, um, which is well trusted. Um, and that social security number is instituted back in 1935. It's become an essential part of our system, both in terms of our social security system, our tax system. Uh, it, it's created some incentives to reduce the amount of the informal workforce. Next slide. So my policy recommendations um, is there's got to be a way to provide more of a lifelong foundation of support for the elderly. Um, the and payroll tax financing, given the informal workforce side, isn't going to work now. That's for sure. So a social insurance model doesn't make sense. But and the targeted state-based systems, they're just not going to meet the core financial needs of the elderly. Next slide. So I think we need a. I think India needs uh, more of a universal or maybe un nearly universal social pensions that's built off the Gandhi schemes since passed this prologue, a flat non-contributory pension for nearly everyone um, uh, that's going to take building a, a delivery infrastructure that's larger than it is now. Um, and, uh, and I would also think that given Cost keeping a monthly benefit very, very modest uh, would be a pretty essential part of that. Next slide. Savings. Um, th the changes that have been instituted in the last several years are incredibly positive, but unless a whole lot more people are into that system, um, future generations are going to be at real risk. And as I've said before, that only is going to increase the pressure in mid-century to adopt much larger universal pensions. Next slide. I, which is, and I'm not the expert to figure out how to substantially increase beyond the current changes here. But you've got to find ways to be able to broaden that retirement saving system as a way to complement whatever uh, 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 foundational benefit there's going to be. Um, and it's going to take money. Uh, it's going to take greater incentives than there are even now. Although I, I've been very impressed from what I've read um, and, and steps trying the, the movement in this direction. Next slide. I think the universal ID that the US has uh, and the the work that India has done in this area are really valuable. Uh, I know that that can be an optional basis for tying to the saving systems or not, retirement saving systems. But I think that trying to move so that that universal ID becomes something that is recognized as a, uh, as a benefit and tax system over time is only going to help India. So, Next slide. Tying that to universal pensions, I think, is an important mechanism. Uh, I know that that uh, uh, certainly helped the United States. Next slide. And fourth, it seems to me that pension security is going to cost more of GDP. And I don't know what it's going to be, but. Uh, 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 in Bangalore, there was a study back that I actually talked to one of our participants on this call about uh, studies about this being 1 to 2% of GDP to establish a universal uh, 500 rupee a month benefit uh, for the elderly. Uh, it is real money and retirement savings could be certainly a lot more. So those costs are, are real if they are moved into, just as they were in the United States, we had to accept and plan to make the fiscal room necessary to be able to 
uh, to provide economic security. Next slide. Next slide. I'll just spend a minute here. As we know, you've got a, some people who are covered. That's the little yellow coverage. If, if those of you who are health experts, this is a classic chart. You can either expand the people who are covered and or what services get covered so that other services are covered beyond, say, right now, hospitalization uh, or and or reduce uh, what people have to pay out of pocket. I would tend to say that the, the, the little yellow box is probably a pretty good example of where India would be uh, with a whole lot of white around it um, in terms of, of uh, both extending to the non-covered, reducing cost sharing and fees and including other services. Uh, so uh, all, all three need to be examined, I think, uh, in the future uh, as they have been in the past and there's been efforts big efforts and positive efforts, but there's still a whole lot of whole lot of weight on this chart. Next slide. Health expenditures are still very low, about 2% of GDP. Um, the primary care and the public health systems are notoriously weak. Um, the, uh, the demand side uh, hospitalization programs have really, uh, when I was there, it was RSBY, and it was just tertiary care. Uh, it's there's been significant expansions here, um, still pretty on an even coverage. Needless to say, um, and out of pocket costs are still pretty high. Although PMJ seems to be making some significant difference in terms of of uh, uh, out of pocket costs, which is positive. That didn't seem to be the case with RSBY at that time. Um, still. Majority of spending uh, is out of pocket, and and uh, so next slide. So we've got his health systems in place for the formal workforce. They're not they're not fantastic, um, but they're there. Um, private voluntary health insurance, um, low coverage levels there. Uh, also. As I talked in our health in the US, the public sector governance stuff is really hard. And uh, CSEP has this great quote. Um, this is the old Brookings in India organization. Um, that's a heck of a challenge, it seems to me. Uh, uh, a as it is to some extent in the United States is that with with all the fragmentation that takes place, how to establish a government management system to be able to uh, uh, to ensure the costs are under control. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to move quickly here because I'm I'm probably getting out of my time. Um, uh, it's a complicated mix of a lot of the United States. Uh, uh, I'm just going to move right on to the next slide. So, big challenges on on cost controls, on governance, on expanding those programs. Go to your next slide, please. I think the biggest one is how to take a how to creep towards universalism, universalism but. That's going to cost a lot of money, and the question is really the extent to which it's willing and it should say capable to support a large and growing share of future GDP costs and health. Um, and what is in my belief system is that without a stronger primary care and public systems to control costs, um, are, are those added GDP costs going to really end up making a difference in people's lives? Um, so that's a that is a big question that relates to GDP. I think next slide. So lessons for the U.S. universal great benefits, but also real costs. Um, it takes a lot of money to make real strides towards universal coverage, as I'm sure you know. 
Um, but you also have to start from where you are as, 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 as every country finds. It's very hard to magically come up with radically different new approaches to things. So starting from where you are, um, uh, uh, which has some improved systems for sure, um, but establishing that strong governance system is essential to be able to deal with the mixed system that we have in the United States and that you have in India. Next slide. So it's hard to see how public costs are not, I don't know, 5%, 8% of GDP by the middle of the 21st century or so. Um, but it's also gonna take a paradigm shift um, on public sector governance to be able to pull that off. I, I don't know if that's where India is headed, but it seems to me that partly it's going to be. Next slide. This is my program models um, that are responsive to uh, adequacy and inclusivity for the population, as well as fiscally sustainable, which is why I think the attention to retirement savings has been such an important one. Um, but we are constrained by our past, so we've got to try to figure out how to build on these systems to move things into the future. Next slide. And this is my last, which is, you know, can India be an important player in the latter half of the 20th century and still not provide access to basic pensions and health care for the elderly? I think the answer to that is no. Um, and I'm left with Nehru's great challenge to us all, which I've always loved for years and years. The policy of being too cautious is the greatest risk of all. I think it's going to take some aggressive actions. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, your presentation is extremely rich and it has to be taken not in one sitting, but in slow motion to keep on going back to mull over the nuances of well, what actually, you actually, have presented. Professor, since it's only uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and I'm still sitting here with my coffee, if we want to spend three hours, we can't. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure yes. everybody wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm saying yeah. for the audience as well as for the researchers, this is not something you take in one sitting. You have to go back to it, and it's a slow hunch, slow understanding of it. Uh, I'm very glad that you put pension and health together, because I think increasingly we need to think of the two together. And one reason for it, which uh, uh, I know in Ed Wharton and uh, Olivia Mitchell, others, they are doing a lot of work on this, is the uh, issue of old, old people. Because a lot of the costs are going to be driven by the old, old, those who are 80 years and above. Because this is where the healthcare cost, others, and so on become. Uh, slope becomes steeper as the research has shown. And I think this is growing. Oh. McCool, you've disappeared. Did, do other people hear him? No. Kenneth, even I can't hear him. I think he'll appear again. If he has disappeared, he'll probably take a minute and come back. Yeah, come back. Okay. We'll wait for a minute till he comes okay. back. Yeah, let yeah, me know then. when. Because my I can see my picture. We, we can hear, hear you now. You. We could not we, hear you. You cannot hear. We can hear you now. 
Just for about a minute, we could not hear you. Now we can hear you. Now we can't hear you. Okay, since you can't hear me, I will nope. wait for a while, but can we take we the can, questions? We, can, the we can hear you. We can hear you now. Oh, you we can, can hear, hear you. Okay. Yes. Now. Thank you very much. So the, I think the one issue, Mukul, you're gone again. Action in the US is the past. You said that past does represent a constraint. Now in India, that is really the case because in the past, social security issues were not, uh, or, uh, social security organizations not professional. There was no professionalism there. I, uh, I've been working on them for many, many years, and I know low professionalism. So how do you increase that level of protect, uh, professionalism? And in that, one area where India's recent initiatives, I'm very supportive of what is going on. Uh, one aspect that I like is that India is trying to provide services. This insight comes from Peter Diamond's work on pensions at MIT, uh, that the elderly are not looking for bits of money. They are looking for the affordable, accessible services. So that those, how do you provide those services? That is where Ayushman Bharat, and the wellness centers, others are coming from, and Ayushman Bharat is new, it will expand slowly. So India will not have a universal as one scheme. The scale is too big. US is big, 330, 40 million people. India is 1,000. <laughs> to have a universal scale like that would be difficult. But in that, the service provision and the core contribution, how you do it in a manageable way, including YP and others, is very important. Now, when you do those, one area that comes up is the actuarial expertise and the actuarial analysis. US has some great actuarial calculations. I follow the Social Security's 75 year projections. There are states, so on. India doesn't have anything like that. So when we collaborate as US and eGrow, maybe one of the areas we should do is try to focus on a smaller thing, like actuarial projections. What do you do? How do we try to improve them in a particular context? The, this, the other area is the risk in the payout phase. And the risk in the payout phase since lot is, is DC, is real. This includes 401k as well. Right. 401k at 60, 59 and a half, you can withdraw, or what do you do with it? And there is no real analysis that there are investment risks, there are other risks in the payout phase as well. And I think we need to have more uh, innovative thinking um, in, in in that in that area uh, uh, as well, and the you mentioned about the 
political economy. And I think political economy is going to be key, both for India, we have to have the support. We are having some controversy about civil service pension policy. So on the political economy uh, basis, and you will have similar type of thing. So I think we need to uh, put our minds together to see how we find solutions to a to a manageable problems while we are looking at the big picture like this. Okay, sorry, I went on a little bit, but um, uh, I wanted to my well, views respond. On, I think that, that. that most of your points I just absolutely agree with. I think the actuarial uh, capabilities. Uh, I just talked to Stephen Goss, who you may know is our our chief actuary at Social Security. Who just has a, an international reputation for their whole organization does. And it's so important yeah. that it be viewed as independent and legitimate as opposed to partisan and political. Um, and they, right. they, they really do that in a very strong way. And it's an, it's essentially important part to this. Um, the, the only area that I would tend to push back on is I don't really see how uh, 200 rupees a month for a small subset of the population is going to make it anywhere near that, that, that there needs to be a foundational benefit, even if it's a very, very modest one that goes up at age 80. As you know, by that time, you've got health care costs that are uh, consuming right. so much. So to me, uh, this is where I think. And you mentioned Peter Diamond's work. He's he's been a strong believer of of a foundational benefit as well. It doesn't not a social insurance benefit, but something that is close to universal, very modest that people right. can count on. Um, that seemed to me to be uh, moving aggressively towards that uh, is not a is not a radical cost item, uh, and. Uh, particularly now, it'll be more costly 30 years from now, but India's GDP will be considerably larger 30 years from now. So to me, that's the one where I think that there could be some real progress. Uh, I, and then in terms yes. of the, the, uh, 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 the different states' capabilities to be able to manage and oversee programs, uh, I... Uh, Question whether there needs to be a stronger federal presence here uh, to 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 not just be the supplemental one. But that that's um, I I don't know all the details on how to do that, but I do worry about given the uneven management delivery systems throughout the states that uh, to to rely on strengthening that seems to me to be an unrealistic assumption. Now, if, as you know, health is a state subject, so, so political economy is so critical. And yeah. I, the, the issue is not just 200 rupees. Issue is whether they are getting the basic services and needs. So India is feeding 800 million people for the past three years in food. So you don't need that reduces your expenditure levels. So so the so there are different ways and the different type of programs that uh, yes, India needs to think about and how do you approach it? But you said very rightly that don't overcome it and go back. Very difficult. So be cautious and let's keep on strengthening the family as much as you can. It it is already a problem, but keep strengthening. Uh, but but so so that. Political management, all the issues you talked about, the technology, organizational efficiency, and all that is something that is a, a process that must be worked on. So I think we should get to the questions. Who would like to ask the first question? Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Uh, so I'm. Ramakrishnan, I'm a first year PhD student of Applied Microeconomics at the Economic and Social Research Council, United Kingdom. Uh, so I have a 
I have a very pertinent question. Like, uh, firstly, uh, it was a very enlightening presentation. Uh, you 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 covered it all comprehensive. Uh, so I believe that in in my knowledge, um, social securities two crown jewels are uh, the health expenditure and the pension. So these both form like the major things of can, social security. Sorry, sorry. Given the time, can you ask your question, please? Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask that uh, it is the people in the low income strata who are most affected. Uh, you're muted, I think. Okay, while, while he fixes that, may I take <laughs> another question, please? Said. Who, who else would like to ask the question? Can I, I ask? I would, I would uh, say that. Can I ask? Many sir, I am, can I ask I am a question, sir? I am just Sivaram, one, sir. One at a time. At a time. Uh, sir, I am Can you speak? Can I speak, sir? Uh, you are Mr. Sivaram. Ah uh, yes, sir. Okay, please ask briefly <laughs> and to the point. Many state governments have returned back, uh, returned to the old pension system, uh, sir, on political grounds. Uh, uh, what is what is the what is its impact, sir? Actually, is it a right way of resuming old pension system in the place of new pension system that was introduced in two thousand four, sir? I know that there were a couple of questions, including yours, in the chat on this, uh, and clearly this is a uh, uh, it's it's one of the hot issues that's going on now with the with the government workers. Um, uh, and uh, the old system being converted and what have you. Uh, and I know that several states have now started to go back to the old DB, defined benefit model, guaranteed benefits over a period of time as opposed to savings. Uh, it, it is, uh, 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 it, my own reaction here is that, uh, uh, the defined benefit pension will provide certainly greater guarantees of economic support for this small group of people, but that it's not the single place where I, if I had a dollar to spend, I wouldn't spend it there. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the government pension system is still pretty doggone strong compared to what it is for large proportions of the Indian population. So when I see uh, uh, what it reminds me in the United States of efforts to expand um, programs for the most advantaged of the population, um, as opposed to shifting and doing more for the lesser part of the population. Uh, so um, no doubt these these changes are taking place in some states, and it's going to end up potentially being costly for the for those programs i just in a word i would say if i had a dollar i wouldn't spend it there i would spend it more on the on on the bottom two thirds than i would on uh, on on government employees and and on uh, uh, actually or on uh, pensions for people who are getting employer based pensions i don't know mccool whether you have an a, a, a response have, on that as well just, just one, one comment. There is a lot of talk by certain states on going back, but going back is not at all easy because the 2004 uh, law does not provide for return of the contributions and accumulations back to the states. And so many states are saying, but hardly any are actually uh, going to be able to implement it. 
and they will soon find that in a competitive federalism, they will lose out if they were to do so. Let me leave it at that because this we can just go on on this. Uh, next question, please. Can I ask? Yes, Am please. I audible? You are I am well, please, brief. Uh, I am Madhugurian from Kerala. I have two brief questions. One is India, uh, India is a country where vast majority of people are engaged in the informal sector. So, what measures you have uh, to, to make get them inclusive in this? That is one of the questions. The second, I am from Kerala. Uh, and Kerala is much advanced in India. India is a federal system. Uh, but unfortunately, the point is that even old age pensions, uh, agriculture workers, old age pensions, all these, the government is, the, the state is providing. But, but unfortunately, the state, uh, Kerala government uh, is in a terrific uh, public debt crisis. So this fiscal situation is very bad. And the central government is not at all in favor of uh, allowing the state to borrow more. So this is a, in a, in a federal setup, this is a crisis. And what may be your uh, uh, suggestion to overcome this? Thank you. Thank you. The, the, uh, I only, heard, I only got, I only got Hello. part of that, but what I would Hello. say is that this needs to be thought of as a a long term uh, effort. Uh, so, e even if there is some fiscal crunch now uh, that is going on, and Car I mean, Kerala still has this just about the strongest, I think, in India in terms of, of its systems, um, that, uh, th that long ter longer term investments here, I think, will still be, uh, will still be worthwhile doing. But I understand that there are short term fiscal challenges that are real. Oops, I just lost you all. Thank you. Hello. I'm back. Uh, yes. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Am I audible? Uh, yes, please ask a brief uh, question. Uh, please. Excuse me, sir. My uh, your presentation was awesome and I just want to uh, add one point. This is my observation. The countries like India where majority of the population is either, you know, poor or medium, uh, low income or middle class people. Don't you think that ki, uh, if we, you know, uh, do like this public health or social security, everything, don't you think that it will put a uh, middle income group more into burden as compared to, you know, the people who are uh, top 10 percent or the lower, they are already being uh, getting benefit in so many forms. This is just my observation, you know. Uh, you know, putting in somebody's pocket and extracting from somebody's uh, somebody else pocket. I think it won't be uh, make a balance in the countries like India. Thank you I think, for your question. I think those are I think those are very strong points. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Next question, please. Very brief. Are there any maybe more people questions? Want, maybe people want dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on 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 mm -hmm. note, thank you very much. It has been a great initiative by e Growth Foundation to start this type of dialogue, even though US, India in income terms are at very opposite end of the spectrum, uh, we can learn a lot. And my suggestion is that we take some smaller areas and have some uh, brainstorm sessions, learning sessions, so that we can improve in terms of the management uh, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been it's been an honor to be yes. back in 
in connecting to India. I my half year in India was one of the my wife and I both were one of the most wonderful experiences. And Sharon meeting up with you in Bangalore was one of the great moments. So enjoyed it all. Yes, so let me thank both of you, Professor Mukul and Professor Kenneth, for this absolutely, absolutely highly informative, very rich, and I think from a practical angle, uh, very pertinent contribution to the debate in our country. As you have seen the questions, we are in the midst of, should we go back to the old pension scheme, the people who are asking for it, and as Professor Mukul said, that may not be easy, but because a country like India is always in a populist and competitive populism, we are always in election mode. These issues become very important. Also, to some extent, they can dilute the fiscal discipline. But then the issue is, as Professor Kenneth, you mentioned, and I thought that graph which you showed was a very powerful graph of what decile uh, do you belong to? And what proportion does the social security become part of your overall income? I think that's a very important uh, graph which you showed us. And then the questions that come up is 200 rupees or 500 rupees or even 1000 rupee a pension sufficient for that lower segment of the society. Now to that lower segment of the society, Professor, I must mention that as COVID hit India, all of us were told that all the effort that India had done in improving the poverty levels and helping people climb up out of the poverty uh, level is all going to go wrong and maybe 200 million people will fall back into the poverty trap. That's the time when the government under its public policy and I thought very prudent and very intelligent, they started providing free food to nearly 80 800 million people, which continues even today. And then there are studies which were done in IMF, two studies very well known. Uh, one of them is Surjit Bhalla, who was, who was our advisor, who did a study and they said that no, India has been able to stave off this risk and people haven't really fallen below the poverty line. And one of the reasons that happened was food security was provided at any cost. So though our old age pension will be 200 rupees a month for elderly, but once free food is being provided to the household uh, and 800 million people being provided to that extent that uh, old age pension or universal pension, or even if state is giving something gets uh, added. In addition, uh, as Professor Mukul was saying, the American system of social security is little differently placed than India. Uh, one is the food security, as I mentioned to you. The other is the hospitality, uh, the hospitalization expenses, health expenses. Now, you have rightly mentioned uh, it's a state subject. And also rightly mentioned it's an important issue, especially for the elderly. Elderly, it is an extremely important issue. But in our country, during COVID, as an illustration, the government again said, that you would have free vaccines and any medical expenditure that would be incurred due to COVID or COVID related, you could walk into any hospital, government or private and get treatment free of cost. And also recently, uh, as Professor Mukul was mentioning the Aushman Bharat, and uh, we have uh, recently introduced a scheme where for 5 lakh rupees worth, of medical treatment is being provided to a large number of people on a very small registration cost and a very small insurance cover. So yes, actuarial calculations are important, but when you have universal, quote, unquote, as I was mentioning in COVID time, quote, unquote, when you have such universal health coverage and support then many a times, I think the definition of a universal pension needs little correction. And these, these have to be then added in and then examined as to what is the expenditure that is being incurred 
on insurance as well as health uh, and old age pension. In any case, Professor Kenneth, you made us thinking and a good scholar, a good professor is one who <laughs> initiates a thinking process and you have done it for us and Professor Mukul has added uh, to the discussion also making us think about these issues. So I want to thank each one of you profusely for taking time, talking to us, and sharing your rich experience and issues with us. It's always an honor to be talking to wonderful people in India. Thank you. And uh, I wish things are better if uh, Professor Kenneth, uh, you could again visit India. We'll be so happy to host a series of talks for you across the country. Uh, I must also share next week. Uh, no, firstly, this recording, this rich recording will be available by noon tomorrow for everyone to share with others. I'm going to, of course, share with the government because and Niti Ayo because it is so rich. Also want to mention two more points. Next Friday, 4 to 5 p.m., we have another discussion on the monetary policy. So I would welcome you all for that. And the last announcement I want to make is, uh, as you have all heard about financial literacy, EGRO Foundation is making an attempt on economic literacy. Every evening, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m., one hour online, we are delivering a talk on some or the other important economic issue. And these happen in capsules of five, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It could be a macroeconomic issue. It could be an Indian economic issue. It could be something related with IBC, the uh, bankruptcy codes that we have insolvency and bankruptcy codes. So we have something or the other going on every evening, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. I would request you, all of you, to take advantage of that. And if you have an opportunity, share it with others. Our objective is the digital world that we have, the online provisions that we have, anyone and everyone across the country should have the advantage of listening to the best minds and the people who speak on these one hour online uh, webinars are people like me who are retired, who have worked at senior positions, who have worldwide experience, even the extent of serving as a chief economist at important institutions, they're the ones who are here to speak for one hour every day. So you have a spectrum of people who have joined us in this endeavor of spreading economic literacy across the nook and corner of our country. I would encourage you to please share with others and take advantage of this. With this, let me conclude our today's talk. We are about 20 minutes uh, over and above the hour scheduled time. I apologize for that. Um, I want to once again thank each one of you for making the discussion rich. Once again, Professor Kenneth and Professor Bukal, thanks again for joining us. Have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.